tonight on Reporting Scotland. An inquiry finds the deaths of three people at a motor rally in the Scottish borders could have been avoided. We assumed it was a safe area. The organisers didn't tell us anything different. They came through with the spectator control cars and nobody moved us back. Also on the programme. As Kezia Dugdale prepares to take part in I'm a Celebrity, Scottish Labour say she won't be suspended from the party for now. The 1st of May next year, that's the date minimum pricing for alcohol will start here. It's exit stage left for performers at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow's Gorbals, moving out to make way for a multi-million pound facelift. And Paris Saint-Germain play host to Celtic, who are in France preparing for their latest Champions League clash. Good evening. A sheriff has ruled that the deaths of three people who were killed in a rally crash in the borders in 2014 could have been avoided. The year before, a woman died at the Snowman rally near Inverness. A fatal accident inquiry into the two crashes concluded a series of recommendations for improving safety. You may find some of the images in Morag Kinneborough's report distressing. Late May 2014, the Jim Clark rally through the borders. With local roads closed, many had come to watch cars racing at speeds over 80 miles an hour. We assumed it was a safe area. The organisers didn't tell us anything different. They came through with the spectator control cars and nobody moved us back from the taped area they were standing in. The Leetwater Bridge is an accident black spot. One rally car spun off the track here earlier that day. But rally crowds are drawn here, keen to see cars tackle this section of the course. And areas before and after this bridge and on each side of the road were meant to be completely clear of people. Images from just before the crash might be upsetting. I heard a rushing sound as the car came round. I was running at that stage and all I felt was a bump and it was flat uh, face down into the field. Managed to get myself up slightly and then collapsed after that. And then uh, basically silence. Photographer Ian Proven, his partner Elizabeth, known as Betty, and their friend Len Stern, all from Glasgow, died. The sheriff ruled their deaths might have been avoided if they'd been clearly banned from danger areas. He found weak and inadequate safety checks, a series of mistakes, misunderstandings and misfortune. A year before Valentine's weekend, Glen Urquhart Forest by Drumna Drochet. I uh, first realised something was wrong when we were in the, uh, in, uh, awaiting to start the stage. Uh, we were in our car, waiting for our time, uh, and we knew that the stage had been stopped for an incident. Uh, we had no idea what that is. A signal had been given to stop the race, but there were already cars on the track. Joy Robson from Sky died. Witnesses say she saved an eight-year-old boy beside her. The sheriff found no reasonable precautions which might have avoided her death. He recommended better warning systems for drivers, and better marking and enforcement of banned areas. Many safety improvements were made after a government review two years ago. The volunteers who run rallies say they want to make them as safe as possible, but the sport is inherently dangerous. How one is expected to marshal and contain spectators over 80 miles worth of uh, forests or fields where locals can find their way in, have been doing it for years and think they can get away with it. If the Jim Clark rally resumes, one of the victims' families wants the Swinton stage suspended for a year as a mark of respect for those who died. Maura Kinneborough, reporting Scotland. Kezia Dugdale, the former Scottish Labour leader who has controversially joined the I'm a Celebrity show in the jungle, won't be suspended. Instead, she will be interviewed on her return home to, as the party put it, give her version of events. Her partner, who is an SNP MSP, says Kezia Dugdale has been hurt by some of her colleagues' criticism. Here's our political correspondent, Andrew Kerr. She's ready for a new adventure away from politics. Kezia Dugdale looks defiant on the helipad, preparing to be dropped off in the jungle. Her critics back home may not worry her, but maybe the critters in the bush are a cause for concern. 
Thundering up the corridor, three by three, Richard Leonard is the new king of the jungle, at least in the Labour Party. The group were going to consider suspending Kezia Dugdale. Some of her colleagues have been critical. Her partner, an SNP MSP, said the comments hit home before Ms Dugdale jetted off. I think it's really hurtful actually that she, she did see some of that commentary over the weekend. Obviously the news of it breaking broke before she went out. Uh, she is a late addition to the show along with another contestant as far as I understand it. Um, so it wasn't meant to be uh, in the public domain at that time. So she was quite hurt by some of those things. But she's taken a lot of spirit from the good luck messages she's had from lots of people. The Labour leader emerged after the meeting. As Kizia Dugdale been suspended, Mr Leonard, what was the decision the meeting in there? Uh, we'll make a statement in due course. Later they said Miss Dugdale wouldn't be suspended. She's terrified of spiders, but she'll have to face Labour bosses on her return. Well, it's quite, it's quite serious in the sense that Kezia has gone off to Australia for you know, perhaps three weeks uh, without uh, any proper approval. So that's a serious matter. However, the group uh, are quite prepared to listen to what Kezia's explanation for that is, and we'll get that when she returns from Australia. Kezia Dugdale has given up the political jungle here at Holyrood for the real one down under. Once again, she's looking for the public's vote, but in a completely different way. Andrew Kerr, Reporting Scotland, Holyrood. Minimum unit pricing of alcohol is to be introduced in Scotland on the 1st of May next year. The Health Secretary made the announcement at Holyrood on the day new figures showed a year-on-year -year increase in the number of alcohol-related hospital admissions. Here's our political correspondent, Glenn Campbell. The whisky industry fought and lost a legal battle against minimum unit pricing, but their challenge put off the measure's introduction by five years, much to the frustration of Holyrood ministers. Minimum unit pricing of alcohol has been delayed far too long. During the court cases, lives have been lost, and that's why I will move to implement as soon as is practicable. And the chosen date, if Parliament agrees... No alcohol in Scotland will then be sold for less than the specified minimum unit price from the 1st of May 2018. The government wants to push up the cost of strong, cheap booze by making it illegal to charge less than 50 pence per unit. And they hope that will reduce overconsumption of alcohol and the deaths, harm and hospital admissions associated with Scotland's hard drinking culture. In the last year, there were 36,235 alcohol-related hospital admissions across Scotland. That's 685 admissions for every 100,000 people, up 2% on the year before. So what difference do the experts think a minimum price of 50p per unit might make? Around 1,200 fewer hospital admissions each year due to alcohol and around 120 fewer deaths each year due to alcohol. So these are quite big reductions in the amount of harm that alcohol causes in Scotland. Any extra you pay will be retained by retailers, but they're not expecting a boost. This is very unlikely to lead to higher profits for retailers. The reality is if the policy works as the government intends, it means it'll be lower sales, that means less revenue for retailers and overall less income coming from alcoholic products. A consultation on a 50p minimum price will start next week, allowing the measure to take effect from May next year. Glenn Campbell, Reporting Scotland. The latest ferry to join the CalMac fleet has been launched. The MV Glen Sanox was built at the Ferguson Marine Yard in Port Glasgow, and it's the first British ferry to be powered using natural gas. But delays mean the vessel won't enter service until 2019 at the earliest. That's months later than scheduled. Our transport correspondent David Henderson has more. Preparing to sail for the very first time. The ferry MV Glen Sanox leaves dry land for the open sea. Built on the Clyde for Calmac, it's the first UK ferry to use a cleaner type of engine which runs on natural gas. But that's led to delays and mounting costs. You know, yes, you will have uh, delays on occasion because of complexities. Uh, there will always be final reckonings around the uh, final costs of big complicated projects like this, but this is a good news story and this is making sure that our island communities are served by the best possible vessels for many years to come. What a change this shipyard has seen. 
Three years ago, the gates were closed, workers were laid off when the firm collapsed. Now, a new owner has breathed fresh life into this old business. We've had to um, rebuild the whole yard, as you see. The last thing we built was the new office building. It, it, still a few finishing touches to go to that, but the whole yard's been transformed and it had to be. We're introducing modern manufacturing techniques and build techniques for the boat so that we can be competitive. And, you know, we now employ 360 people here. There were seven left when we bought it from the administrator. She doesn't look like much yet, but the MV Claymore is next in line for completion. Again, she'll be fitted with a dual fuel engine for use between Sky and Harris. So one vessel has been launched and the workforce turned their attention to this other sister ship. But there's lots more work to be done and neither vessel is expected to enter service with CalMac until at least 2019. That delay may be felt by passengers awaiting this new Aran ferry, but the work throws a lifeline to this shipyard. David Henderson, reporting Scotland, Port Glasgow. It's budget day tomorrow and the oil and gas sector is hoping for tax changes to stimulate investment in the industry. Spending has largely stalled in recent years because newer firms are wary of taking on the decommissioning liability. Well, meanwhile, the chemical giant Ineos has announced it's to begin oil exploration near Shetland. Our energy correspondent Kevin Keane reports. It's a high-stakes industry, and with no control over the price of oil, every business decision involves an element of gamble. When the cost of a barrel of crude was at its lowest, many firms were losing significant money, hanging on in the hope that the price would rise. But when it comes to decommissioning, the liability is shared between the field's owner and the government, both of whom have already made a tidy profit. In a long-standing deal, some of the tax is returned to contribute to the clear-up costs and everyone's happy. But for newer companies buying older fields to run for a few more years, their profits and the treasuries are much smaller. The problem is the government will only cough up to the full amount of tax the new owner has paid, not enough to fund the decommissioning. How much value can this add to the sector? Yeah, so when we've looked back and we've analysed where we've seen assets transfer hands, um, we've seen that actually it can add up to an average of five years for that asset and up to 14. So it, it is a real value adding proposition for the industry. There have been some deals in recent months, but since the oil crash of 2014, they've been sparse. The purchase of the Bruce Field by Serica Energy sees previous owner BP retain the decommissioning liability in a complex deal. It would be very welcome. I think it would be another tool in the box for the industry. It would make deals like this potentially much simpler and much quicker. And let's, let's remember why we're, we're looking to do this, is to get the right assets in the right hands. The chemicals giant Ineos has made another move into the oil and gas sector. After buying the Forties pipeline, they're now venturing into deeper sea exploration north of Shetland. Any spare cash in there, Chancellor? The eyes of many industries will be on the contents of the Chancellor's red box tomorrow, but the oil sector will be disappointed if its cost-neutral tax proposal is left out. Kevin Keane reporting Scotland, Aberdeen. And our political editor, Brian Taylor, joins me. So, Brian, the Chancellor will be talking tax tomorrow, but any income tax decisions we hear won't be applicable here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We have to factor that in when we're listening to the Chancellor tomorrow. The UK budget, of course, is hugely important, but it is the Scottish Parliament which controls these days income tax rates and bans north of the border. And for the very first time, I expect there to be a real difference, notable, between the, the, the two uh, sections of the United Kingdom, because Scottish ministers are signalling that they see the need for real increases in taxation in Scotland, real increases to fund public spending. But tomorrow's budget does set the, the framework, if you like, for those Scottish income tax decisions. If, for example, the Chancellor announces additional spending for health, housing, education, Scotland gets a share of that money, although Hollywood can, can spend it as it likes. That's the block grant where we're used to that. Here's one we're not used to. The Treasury then withdraws, withholds a portion of money from Scotland because of the revenue the Treasury is losing because Scotland is now in charge of taxation. That's the block grant adjustment. 
deeply, deeply technical, dull as anything, but really matters to all of our lives and is about to have a big impact. Then the Finance Secretary in Scotland, Derek Mackay, announces his tax proposals to fill that gap, if you like. That's a decision will be taken on December the 14th uh, next month. And I think uh, to, to, to stand by, if you like, for changes in taxation in Scotland, perhaps bringing down the ban so that you go into a higher rate at a, an earlier period on a lower income. This budget also, also matters in huge ways. What will happen to pensions? What will happen to benefits, including universal credit? Will there be some impact uh, assessment with regard to Brexit? And above all, above all, will the UK economy forge ahead or falter? Brian Taylor, thank you very much. The former chair of Edinburgh's trams says the company put in charge of building the tram infrastructure was a delinquent contractor. David Mackay was one of the key figures involved in agreeing the deal to bring trams to the city. He told the public inquiry into the project he feared the German contractor Billfinger Berger wanted to bring the capital to its knees. Lisa Summers can tell us more. David Mackay was one of the key figures who agreed the final trams contract. He chaired the company tie that was to deliver trams when problems broke out and work stopped on Princess Street. The inquiry heard that the dispute over Princess Street began because of proposals to keep a bus lane open instead of allowing the contractor to have exclusive access. But instead of coming to an agreement there and then, the standoff escalated. He recalled a conversation with the Deputy First Minister. He, he listened carefully and said, get it sorted. Get it sorted? Get it sorted. What did you take that to mean? I took it, get it sorted or else. And he said, you're not mediating properly. I said, this is not a case of mediation. This is a case of being held to ransom. And what was, his, what was Mr Sweeney's response to that? Get it sorted. The end result, tie back down over Princess Street. They agreed to pay more so work could begin. Princess Street is the most important street in, in Edinburgh, if not in Scotland. Tactics by Infraco were appalling. Mr Mackay told the inquiry that Edinburgh would have been the laughing stock of Scotland and the world if the stalemate on Princess Street had continued. The inquiry in front of Lord Hardy continues. Lisa Summers reporting Scotland, Edinburgh. Now, it's 14 minutes to seven. A reminder of tonight's top story. A fatal accident inquiry has found the deaths of three people in 2014 at the Jim Clark rally in the borders could have been avoided. And still to come. We're in Paris as the French champions prepare for their clash against Celtic tomorrow night. for a fisherman missing off the West Highland coast since Monday. 57-year-old Alistair MacLeod's small creel boat was spotted on rocks near Applecross yesterday afternoon. Several Coast Guard rescue teams from across the Highlands have been searching the coast and shoreline, along with two experienced kayakers. Birth services at a hospital on Skye have been temporarily suspended because of a shortage of available midwives. NHS Highlands said the staffing situation affecting Broadford's Dr McKinnon Memorial Hospital was temporary but significant. The shortage has also affected the out-of-hours midwifery service for the wider Skye and Locauche area. Glasgow Citizens Theatre Company is to move out of its home in the Gorbals for the first time in its 72-year history. The theatre, which dates back to the 19th century, is to undergo a two-year redevelopment costing more than £19 million. Pounds. Aileen Clark reports. No, but we love cake! Rehearsals for Cinderella, the Christmas show at the Citizens. But it's going to take more than a handsome prince to transform this building. This new vision is costing almost £20 million to update and renovate the theatre, which is well over a century old. Some of the walls have become structurally unstable. Um, when it rains, it rains not only outside, but it rains into the theatre, it rains into the foyer, it rains on stage so we can have a show going and it's actually rains coming you know, in, into the auditorium. A lot of the work that we do isn't just on stage, but is out in the community or community groups come here and work with us. So it's really crucial for us that we can maintain a building that, that is an asset and resource for that community. Apart from making it watertight, the Victorian auditorium won't be tampered with. This is the glamorous core which the new facilities will wrap around. 
it's steeped in history and I don't yeah. think, yeah. It's like it's identity, isn't uh -huh. it? And you don't want to... You don't want to lose that. Exactly. As well as having all these amazing new facilities, it, you have to keep the history of a building because that's what keeps people coming back. And the Victorians had an eye for the practical as well as the ornate. You can paint scenery on huge cloths here without stepping on a ladder because thanks to this system, the cloth moves up and down, not the artist. The paint frame as you see it right now in all its glory will remain absolutely identical to what it is. Simply because it's a historical document and B, it just works so well. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. From next summer for two years, the citizens will put on their productions in other theatres in Glasgow. But in the autumn of 2020, they expect to be back into their new reopened and refurbished theatre. And they're promising that if you get in the queue early enough, you can still be one of the lucky ones and get your ticket for 50p. Aileen Clark, reporting Scotland, Glasgow. Sport now. The Celtic face Paris Saint-Germain in their Champions League group tomorrow. The team has arrived in the French capital for what is their last away fixture in the competition. Our senior football reporter Chris McLaughlin is there. This is Celtic's last Champions League game on the road of this campaign. PSG and Bayern Munich have already qualified for the last 16 of the Champions League. For Celtic and Brendan Rodgers, well, it's all about securing that third spot and that Europa League place. The squads arrived here in the French capital a few hours ago. They trained in Glasgow this morning. A massive, massive task on their hands here tomorrow evening. Now, the last time the sides faced each other was in Glasgow a few weeks ago. 5-0 to PSG, remember, was the scoreline. Since then, they have gone on an unbeaten run in the Champions League. 17 goals scored and they have yet to concede an indication perhaps of the magnitude of the task in hand tomorrow evening. We'll have plenty more build-up across BBC outlets tomorrow. We'll hear from the Celtic camp. We'll also hear from the thousands of Celtic fans who have made the journey here to Paris for what seems like Mission Impossible. Meanwhile, the economic benefit of Aberdeen Football Club's planned new stadium could be greater than originally predicted, according to a report. Plans for the £50 million stadium and training facilities at Kingsford have been controversial, with concerns over a loss of green land and greater traffic. New analysis claims the development would create more than 400 construction jobs and bring millions of pounds into the economy. 100 years ago today, a young officer from the Seaforth Highlanders died on a battlefield in France. Ewart Alan McIntosh was just 24 and a keen poet. Today, his writing is largely forgotten, but an academic from Aberdeen University is determined to put that right, as our arts correspondent Pauline McLean reports. If it be life that waits, I shall live forever unconquered. If death, I shall die at last, strong in my pride and free. You may not know the poem, but the words have been inscribed on this war memorial for close to a century. They were written by Ewart Allen McIntosh, a young officer with the Seaforth Highlanders in the First World War. Like many young men of the time, he wrote poetry, but he didn't have the same connections as poets like Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon, nor enjoyed the late revival of interest they did. Ewart Allen McIntosh had paid as part of his will for some of his poetry to be published after the war, and perhaps just by not having those connections, he, he wasn't propelled into fame after the war. And as we know, it was more so the 1960s that Owen became significant, and uh, the Scottish war poets have almost become forgotten. But Neil and his father Kenneth are determined Macintosh won't be forgotten, not least because their family has a very personal connection to him. My grandfather was probably the last man to actually speak to Macintosh. He was with him at uh, Combray when he was killed uh, on the 21st of November 1917. Uh, Mr Macintosh was uh, the officer in charge of his platoon. Uh, my grandfather was second man in the Lewis gun section and uh, Macintosh had taken the Lewis gun team forward to, to look for targets. Uh, Mr Macintosh had uh, very poor eyesight and had lifted his head to, to look for a target and he was shot through the head. Their great-grandfather, Roderick McLennan, returned home, injured, to a hospital in Dingwall. He was just 18, and it was many decades before he talked about the young poet he'd served alongside. Today, they'll lay a wreath on Macintosh's grave, 
A memorial now stands in his honour, although they both believe his legacy is his poetry. Polly McLean, reporting Scotland. Well, let's take a look at the weather now, and it's over to Christopher. Jackie, thank you. Hello there. Well, fairly miserable for many of us today, wasn't it? With cloudy, wet weather and the heaviest of the rain now moving northwards, becoming confined to the far north and the northern Isles, where it will be windy. Elsewhere, cloudy with a few further spells of rain to come, but by the early hours, generally drying up. And uh, temperatures around about four to eight Celsius in towns and cities. I have to say, though, uh, windy across the northern Isles, gale or even severe gale force winds here. So tomorrow starts dry, but it doesn't stay dry. It turns cloudy and wet with rain quickly edging in from the south uh, across the southern uplands in towards the central belt by late morning or lunchtime and then up towards the northeast. And certainly across parts of Dumfrieshire and towards the borders, that rain heavy and persistent pretty much all day tomorrow. So a Met Office yellow be aware warning here. Difficult conditions on the roads. Further north, no warning, but still wet, still quite miserable. Um, further north still and... Northern Aberdeenshire, Murray and towards the Highlands, generally somewhat drier. Perhaps even some hazy brightness for parts of Lewis and Harris. A few spots of rain at times. And after a wet and windy start for the Northern Isles, it improves somewhat. Rest of the afternoon into the evening, still quite wet, particularly in the south. And then further outbreaks of rain edging in. And then it gets interesting because there's a tangle of weather fronts there. But watch what happens as the rain edges northwards, meets colder air and we get snow. Now, there is a Met Office yellow be aware warning in force at the moment. This is for Thursday, and it's going to affect parts of Highland and Grampian. So come first thing Thursday morning, likely to be quite wintry at times, and not only on the higher roads, perhaps some lower level sites as well, perhaps some disruption on the trains too. For the central lowland southwards, it's wet, but it's, it's rain. It's not snow for you. And through the course of the day, the rain and the snow easing off, but it will be cold everywhere. Friday's another cold one. Um, a few wintry showers in the west and northwest, some sunshine in the south and east, but in the wind, three or four Celsius, that's going to feel bitter. That's the forecast for now. Thank you very much, Christopher. And now a reminder of tonight's main news. After 37 years in power, Robert Mugabe's reign is over. This afternoon, the 93-year-old took Zimbabwe by surprise when he suddenly resigned as the country's president, just as impeachment proceedings against him were getting underway. The ZANU-PF party described the resignation of its former leader as the dawn of a new era. A fatal accident inquiry has found the deaths of three people in 2014 at the Jim Clark rally in the Borders could have been avoided. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the headlines at 8 and the late news at 10.25. Until then, good evening.